בנוכים הבאים רבותיי Welcome to another edition of our Thursday night class. Tonight we discuss a most important subject and a subject that unfortunately is neglected by many. And I'm even talking about the religious, the pious, the observant, undervalue <coughs> the subject of tonight's class. <coughs> we learn in our parasha about the different blessings, parashat Vayichi, the blessings that Yaakov Abinu imparted to his children before he died. We would call that the last will and testament, where he called each one of his children, <coughs> and he gave them a tailor-made beracha. We don't know what tribe we come from, but it's certain that we are still enjoying the blessings that were given 3,000 years ago. The repercussions are still being felt today <coughs> by their descendants. But tonight, I'd like to give you a secret, which is a, I have no other way of saying it, a master key. Master key means you can open any lock. The key that a person can tap into all the blessings of the world, of this world and the next world. A key to shalom bayit. A key to finding one's mate. A key to having children. A key to opening up the gates <coughs> of panasa, of wealth. A key to long life and health. It's one small secret, and if one can master it, then already he enjoys eternal blessings. And that is what the Zohar discusses in Parashat Vayelech, based on a pasuk in Yeshayahu. The pasuk is in Yeshayahu, Chavav, Pasuk Bet, Pithu She'arim, V'yavo Goy Tzadik, Shomer Emunim. God says, open the gates, and let the righteous nation enter. Which righteous nation are we talking about? The nation that has faith, Shomer Emunim, the nation that has Emunah. Comes the Zohar and says, Al tikre emunim, ela amenim. Don't read it emunim, but read it fin milashon amen. Open the gates to the nation that is careful in answering amen. Betchush harim, open the gates for them. Kemad di Yisrael patrin leut tarein de berchan. Amen is the key to open up the gates of blessings. And all their prayers will be answered. In this world. And in the next world. In this world, the Shla Kadosh writes, and I have a quote of it here. If a person listens to the blessing, and he answers Amen with Kavana, I didn't tell you what the Kavana is yet. That's the subject of the class. I'm just breaking the ice now. It creates in the heavens a tremendous amount of Kedusha, a tremendous force of holiness. Veshefa. Learn the word Shefa. Shefa means influence, positive influence. Shefa means uh, all sorts of uh, blessings. Shefa is almost the way the Zohar uses it, it's like a pipe. There's a pipe that the pipe has in it all good things, but you need to open it. It's like a water main. You need to open the valve in order to let the, wa- the water run through. Amen is that switch that activates the shefa, the pipes of heaven, and now all the blessings can come down. And he goes on to say how all the prayers are answered. 
He causes a profusion of blessings <coughs> to be showered on the entire world. What is the secret of this Amin? And how does one how does one answer the proper way? And what kavana does he have to have? And what is its secret? How is it such a powerful weapon that unfortunately is so not used? If people would know the value of Aminim, they would follow what the Zohar says, one rabbi called Rav Safra. Rav Safra used to run when he was young, from minyan to minyan, from rooftop to rooftop, just wait to answer the amen of the Kaddish, and to answer the amen of the Berachot. He was what the Pasuk says, Shomer Emunim. He waited to answer amen. He yearned for somebody to make a blessing. He looked at amen as an opportunity. He looked at it as if Borei Olam is giving him a chance now, to enjoy Beracha, and therefore he would pursue the answering of Amen. What is its value? Comes the Gemaran Berachot, I have a copy of it, I have actually a bad copy of it here. The Gemaran Berachot at the end of the eighth Perik. Gadol Ha'one Yoter Min Hamivarich. The Gemara says that the one that answers Amen is even greater than the one that makes the blessing. It's a mind-boggling Gemara. Here you have a fellow that says, Baruch Hashem, Elokeinu Melech HaOlam, Shakol Niyam, he said ten words. And one guy answers Amen. What does Amen mean? Emet. It is true. You're giving a confirmation to what was said. You're giving a, uh, a stamp of approval. Amen. Yes, it is true. That one word is greater than the ten words of the one that made the blessing. How is that possible? If you were asking me, I'd say, well, for sure, give the, the credit goes to the one that makes the mebarech. If anything, you give the one that says amen, you give him an assist. He gets, uh, he gets some credit, but here the given us saying, no, he gets the, uh, the goal. He scores, and the, the guy that made the beracha, he's, he's runner-up. How does that work? So this is what the Gemara says. The Gemara says something very cryptic. Oh, your lives are going to be changed. If you learn this good, you walk out over here tonight's class with a tremendous secret. That means it's true. Bingo, that's amen. It's phenomenal. Look at this. Perfect timing. <coughs> amen. God bless you. So listen to what the listen to what the Gemara says over here. Teda, I'll prove to you that answering Amen is better than the one that makes the blessing. What's the proof? Share gulairin yordin umidgarim b'milhama v'giborim yordin uminatzim. The Gemara says the proof is that the soldiers go down into battle and they fight. And then the battalions that follow them, they come forth and they capture the city and they raise the flag of victory. That's the proof. That if you ever studied anything about the military, you first you have the first group of soldiers, they get their hands bloody, they fight, but there's a battalion behind them that's waiting for them to clear the road, and they drive right in, and they... Pronounce the victory. So the Maharsha asks, what does this got to do with answering Amen? You're giving me military strategy, and then you explain to me, oh, of course, this is the proof. What's the proof? So he says an amazing thing. In heaven, there's what's called Mekatregim. Mekatregim are the prosecuting angels. These prosecuting angels are like prosecuting lawyers. And they're against us. And all day long, they stand in front of the court of God, making a case why we shouldn't deserve to be blessed. Why we shouldn't deserve all the good things that we yearn for. And trust me, since none of us are pure tzaddikim, they have a compelling case. And we give the mekatrigim a lot of material to use on a daily basis. 
And then we come to God and say, Baruch Atah Hashem, Elokeinu Melech HaOlam. And we're trying to tap into the blessings of God. And at that moment, we're waging war against those Meketregim. We're coming along and saying, we want the blessings. And the Meketregim are saying, they don't deserve the blessings. And that is a war. Every time one makes a Meracha, you're trying to defend yourself. You're trying to tell God, look, I do mitzvot, I have a certain amount of intrinsic kedusha. please send down the blessings. And the Mekatrigim now get all fired up and they start to attack. And at the time of the blessing, it's a, it's a bloody war between us and them. And all of a sudden, in the heat of the battle, a second line of attack comes in. All of a sudden the reinforcement troops come from behind and they turn the tide. And now the Meketregim are defeated. Who is that second battalion? Amen. All of a sudden the Meketregim are fighting the guy that's making the Berachah. All of a sudden another guy jumps in. He's right. Oh, hey, now it's two against one. (laughs) Now all of a sudden you have another, another uh, another whole military unit that joined the struggle and they pronounce the victory and the blessing of God gushes forth into the world this is the value of Amen so when one makes a Beracha and it's not answered it's you're in the middle of a story it's, it's, it's incomplete that's why side point Hakam Abadjah has an interesting Hiddush our custom is we say Baruch Atah Hashem Elokeinu Melech HaOlam Bore Piri HaGefen Now I don't want to confuse you with grammar But grammatically It should be Bore Piri HaGafen Because we know That at the end of a Pasuk We always change the Segol To a Batah Instead of Gefen it should be Gafen So how come we don't say Gafen? Is it grammatically incorrect? So says Hacham Abadiah, because the word Gefen is not the last word. The last word is Amen. Which means even when that person answers Amen, that's, he's finishing it for you. You can't answer Amen to your old We know you believe what you're saying. You don't have to say it's true. You said the old Beracha. So Amen is the soft basuk. And therefore he says, you're qualified to say Gefen. So you see over here how important it is. But we go a little further. There might be another reason why greater is the one that answers. Rabbeinu Bahya says, one of the great Sefaradi commentators on the Torah, he writes that in a court of Jewish law, in order for a document or a testimony to be accepted, to have credence, you have to have two witnesses. One witness is thrown out of court. No matter how honest the person is, no matter how credible he is, even if Moshe Rabbeinu comes into a court of Jewish law and he testifies, the court has to say, well, you're only one, we really can't do anything uh, in one witness. But if you get somebody else, then already your testimony has teeth. Then already your testimony has validity. But when you stand alone, it's unacceptable. When a person is making a blessing or a person is reciting the Kaddish, he's a a witness. He's testifying God is the creator of the world. May his name be exalted and blessed. And in the heavens they say it's great, but there's only one man. One man's testimony... It's a nice try, it's a great effort, but it's not accepted. And all of a sudden comes the second witness and says, Amen! I drink to that. Ditto! It's true! And now all of a sudden, in the heavens, it's a testimony now. So it's the Amen that makes the blessing accepted, because he is the second witness. And now it's considered a legitimate endut. Hence, gadol ha'one, yoter min ha'mevarech. The great rabbi called the Ramah, Rabbi Moshe Israelish. 
He asked a question, hopefully a philosophical question. He said, when does an infant merit Olam Abba? At what age does a child qualify? Does he have to be Bar Mitzvah? At his uh, third birthday, when he starts, uh, takes his first haircut, when exactly does a child qualify for Gan Eden? Oh, true. Very true. So the Rama quotes from a midrash, and the midrash clearly says, and I have the copies of it in front of me. I'm not going to confuse you with all the terminology. But it says, once the child answers Amen the first time, that's his entry to Gan Eden. From here, he says, came the Jewish custom that parents at a very young age train their children to say Amen. You all do the same. When the child is just starting to talk, say Amen. Say Amen. Where do we get this custom? Why say Amen? Because God forbid we want our children to live to 120 years. We want our children to earn Olam Abba in doing all the 613 mitzvot. But we want to secure an insurance that in the worst scenario, that child will be in Netzach Netzachim. He will enjoy an eternal existence because of that one Amen. Do I have to tell you what eternity is? One Amen! One Amen! It takes less than a second to say it. And look what it can buy you. Look what it can acquire you. It can bring you an eternal position in the afterlife. Based on this, <coughs> we explained from a great rabbi called Rabbi Eliyahu Kohen from Izmir. It's a rabbi that lived about 300 years ago. He wrote a sefer called Menhat Eliyahu. He's also the same author of the book called Shevet Musar and the author of the book called Mi'il Sedaka. Great Sefaradi luminary from Turkey. And he writes the following. This is his patented Hidush. We have a Pasuk in Megillat Esther. I know I'm a little early before Purim, but after Hanukkah already we can talk Purim a little. Vayhi omen et hadasa. He ester bat dodo. Ki en la avvaim. Literally it means, and Mordechai raised hadasa. Hadasa was ester, she was an orphan. She didn't have parents. Vayhi omen, he became not only the father of ester, but he also was the mother, the Gemara says. Vayhi omen, literally in Hebrew, omen means a nurse. The Gemara says a miracle happened. Mordechai was able to nurse Esther. Miracle of miracles. By he, oh man, he was a wet nurse. Says the Bidiyawa Kohen. By he, oh man, oh man is also the same letters as Amen. By he, Amen, it Hadasa. He trained Hadasa from a young age to say Amen. Why? Ki en la avaim. She didn't have parents to give that Hinuch. And therefore you see, this was a practice done by the greatest men of the Sanhedrin, that in educating their children, at inception, a man was one of the foundations, it was one of the pillars. Vahi o man, he trained her to answer a man. And then he goes on to say, David Amelech in his career of greatness, Says in one of the chapters of Tehillim, Lule emanti lirot betu vashem beeretz hayim. David Amelech talks about his anticipation of enjoying the eretz hayim, the land of the living. The land of the living is Gan Eden, is Olam Abba. And David Amelech says, What credit, what zechut? is going to get him a share of the afterlife. He says, Lule he'emanti. He'emanti also comes from the Lashon Amen. Because I was trained as a youngster. I was trained, I was indoctrinated into the subject of Amen. And because he'emanti, 
I was already trained in the concept of Amen. I'm going to enjoy to see the afterlife. And that's what the Pasuk means, Shomer Emunim. Shomer Emunim. Well, if you'll allow me tonight, and I know we don't often do this in this uh, venue, but if you'll allow me to take it to a little deeper level, so you can understand the true mystique and the true secrets behind this one word. And now you'll start to understand what its true value indeed is. I'd ask you at this point to please focus because we're going to go into the, the upper levels now. It's well known that God Almighty has many names. According to the Zohar, <coughs> each one of the names of God represents another trait. There's the trait of mercy, there's the trait of judgment, there's the trait of sustenance to the world, there's the trait of grace and charm. Every name, there's a name of protection, there's a name of uh, uh, fertility. Every name of God represents another aspect of God's Manifestation in the world. I want you to know that out of all the names, the holiest name that we have is Yud Ke Vav Ke. We call that Havaya. We're not allowed to say even the letters. It is forbidden to even say Yud and then say He. You have to say Yud Ke Vav Ke. That's how holy the name is. You can't even say the letters individually. Certainly we're not allowed to read it. Has shalom. That's the holy fall of the name of a Kadosh Baruch Hu. And it's a miracle that God allows us to even say it. Who are we to mention the holy name of Borei Olam? We should have to go to the Mikveh every time we say His name. This name over here is the name of ultimate mercy. Where God showers through this name, all the beracha. So holy is it that when a sofer is writing a sefer Torah, every time he writes the name Yudke Vavke, I want you to know there are some sofrim that every time they write God's name, they go to the mikveh. Why does the sefer Torah cost a lot of money? Because the sofer has to pay for all his um, the mikveh expenses. You know, he has to pay the, the five dollars for every uh, every shame to go into the mikveh. But you understand what I'm saying? And he has to say, "Hadeni kotev et Hashem leShem kadosh shel kadosh." You have to have kavana when you write it. You can't just write the name of God. So it's a miracle. I'm telling you that he even lets us say the name. And I'll tell you why he lets us say the name. When you mention a person's name, you're drawn to that person. Think about it. When I address you by your first name, not only do you feel closer to me because I mention you by your name, I say, Nat. Oh, now you feel there's a feeling, there's a sensation all of a sudden. You're referring to the, to the essence of the person. Now, not only does the person hearing his name feel close, but when you mention the name, it automatically brings you closer to him. It's an amazing phenomenon. I'm not a salesman, but they'll teach you that when you go to, uh, to business school. Always learn all the names of the buyers and the salespeople. So when you walk in, you mention their name, automatically there's a technique, or then you're, they're close to you all of a sudden. But you come along and, uh, you, what, what, you, what, you. Now already uh, it's cold, uh, you, you lost the feeling. That's why many times when you get into an argument with somebody, you don't even want to say their name. That person over there, who? I'm not going to even say his name. Why? Why? Where's, where's that? Come say his name. Was a question to say his name. I can't even say his name. Why? Because even if you say his name, what am I? You're going to be close to him. You're not going to be close to him. I can't mention his name.
God says, I want you to be close to me. So, even though I shouldn't allow you to say my name, but because I want you to get attached to me, say the name. Don't say it as it's written. So, Yudke Pavke, we say Ado, we call it Adanut. Right, we mean it Ado, even, but that's already a gift of God. And that's what the Pasuk means. Because God lets us use His name, we become attached to Him. It's a chesed. Now watch. God's name, Yudke Vavke, numerically equals 26. I know you know that. Many people, they go up to the Sefer Torah, they donate $26 to the yeshiva. Where they get the number 26? That's the numerical name of God. Yud, and then a He, and then a Vav, and then a... That equals 26. Incidentally, side point, in English, the word God also equals 26. Right, let's figure it out together. A, B, C, D, E, F, G. G is 7. H, I, J, K, L, M, N, O. O is 15. 15 and 7 is 22. A, B, C, D is 4. That's 26. Ah, but that doesn't mean anything, by the way. The Kabbalah doesn't talk about that word. This is, if you're writing notes, just put that in parentheses. That's just that's a tidbit. That's just the, for the entertainment value of the class. We're giving you some... Uh, unfortunately, that's probably the only thing you're going to remember from this class. But that's okay as well. Now, there's another name of a Kadosh Baruch Hu. Alif Dalid, and then a Nun, and then a Yud. You see that name in the Amidah, for example. Atagi Bor Le'olam, you see that name. That's called Adanut. Now, that's the name of God of judgment. So you have some, you know, uh, kinder names, and you have the name of uh, Gibura. Listen, good, I'm giving you basics now to, the, to open up your minds to the world that you've never heard of. Don't tell anybody we're doing this over here. Just keep the, maybe you lock the doors. Adanut. That's judgment. So the Zohar says a concept like this. The purpose of our coming into this world is to take that name Adanut, which is judgment, and if we can miraculously turn it and flip it into mercy, that's the purpose. Flip it. Turn the judgment into mercy. And the way the Zohar says it, if you can sweeten, you can sweeten it. It's like you have something bitter. You put sugar on it. Oh, what a great concept. You took the bitter item. The sugar remains sugar. Now you're able to take something bitter and also make it sweet. Unbelievable. That's the highest level. So the Zohar says, how do you do that? So if you could take the name Yudke Vavke and you could somehow create a new name, a third name. You have Yudke Vavke over here. You have Adanut over here. Incidentally, how much is Adanut equal? Oh, the Yetzirah doesn't want us to talk about this. He's going to, he's going to interrupt us here for a while. This is accepted, because once we already enter the next level, there's going to be interference here. Pay no attention to the interference. And it would also help if you close your phones. Now, Adanut is Alif Dalid Nun Yud. That equals 65. You following so far? You have the 26 name over here, Yud Kevavke. You have the 65 name over here. So the Zohar says, if you could somehow put them together and create a third word. If you could put... What do you mean? We never heard of this word. We know Yud Kevavke. We know that word. You're putting them together. Yeah, create a new recipe. Create. Put the name together. That would be the highest level of mercy. Because the sweet is sweet, and now you make the bitter sweet. Oh, now you have Rahamim uh, Gedolim. Uh, How do you do that? So the Zohar says, it's called the Shiluv. Take the first letter of Yud Kevav. Okay, right, Yud. Take the first letter of Adanut, Aleph. Take the second letter. He. Take the second letter of the other word, Dalit. 
Take the third letter, Vav. Take the third letter, Nun. Take the fourth letter, He. Take the fourth letter, Yud. One for one. Take one of this, and one of, now you created the new name, one of the highest levels of Rahamim. So far so good? And the numerical value of both of these names, oh, 91. 91. This is a great madriga, this is the magic number. If you're playing tonight, the lotto, don't play the lotto. But num- 91 for us is a magical number. It's the combination of both of the names. Incidentally, incidentally, you'll always see this number come up when we need great mercy. For example, on the holiday of Sukkot, we leave our homes, we sit in a hut, we're exposed to the elements. It's quite dangerous, we're outside. In our homes we have alarms, we have surveillance, we have bolts. In a sukkah, you're exposed, you're outside. And therefore you need God to give you protection. Incidentally, the word sukkah equals 91. Samech vav chaf he. Because you need, you need the great mercy of God. And sukkah. And as a matter of fact, if you look at the language of the Talmud, when it tells you to go sit in the sukkah, the rabbis are very careful in their language. The Torah says, Tse medirat keva, veshev medirat arai. Tse, leave your permanent dwelling and go into the temporary dwelling. What do you mean, tse? Just say, go sit in the sukkah. What are they being so dramatic? Tse medirat keva, tse sadi alef. Said the Aleph is 91. The rabbis were alluding. You need the protection of these two Shemot. You're now spacing in the names. And this is what you came to this world to do. To. That's why the Mikubayim, they don't like to do what I just did. They don't like to cross their hands. Because according to the Kabbalah, one of the, one of the hands is Yud Kevavke and the other name is Aleph Dalit. And when you're putting them together, it's fine to put them together. But now you can't undo it because it might be like erasing Hashem's name. Oh, leave that, that's for another class. Don't pay, t- pay no attention to that. I shouldn't have said that. We go further. Let's talk about Noah's Ark for a minute. Oh, I'm, I'm giving you a long route. Noah's Ark, Tevat Noah. <clears throat> Tevat Noah was like a sukkah in the sense that it was a structure. And Noah really needed mercy. Uh, more than a sukkah. Here, you had torrential waters, flood waters, crashing into the, into the Teva. Noah needed protection from the outside, as well as the inside. You have to remember, the inside of the Teva was uh, a zoo. There was only animals. And Noah lived in a jungle for one year, exposed to all the wild animals. So, Noah definitely needed, the way I would say it, he needed the mercy of God. He needed 91 Compounded. You know, just one, one combination would not be enough for what Noah needed. The Torah tells us the dimensions of the Teba. The Torah tells us the Teba was 300 amot long. The Teba was 50 amot wide and 30 amma high. I never understood why the Torah has to tell us these dimensions. So what? Well, anybody going to build a Teba at home? You have to know exactly, it was 300 by 30 by 50, big deal. What's, what's the purpose of knowing uh, these dimensions? Tell me, what are the Teba? Is it 300 or 320? What's the purpose? Says the great Ga'un Malbin. He says, these dimensions are very significant. Now pay attention closely. I wish I would have brought a, a, a blackboard or a, an easel. But I think we can do this in our minds. Yud Kevavke is over here. Aleph Dal and Yud is over here. The two names, yeah? <coughs> we need to compound them now. The first letter is Yud. The first letter is Aleph. Ten? One. Ten times one? Ten. Go to the second letter. He. Yud Ke. He. The second letter is Dalit. Five times four? 
20. 20 plus 10? 30. That's the measurement 30. Ushloshim ama komata. The next letter, Yud Kevav. The third letter, Aleph Dalad Nun, 50. 6 times 50? 300. Shelosh Me'ot Ama, 300 Ama long. And the last letter is Al Yud Kevav Ke is here. Aleph Dalad Nun Yud is 10. 5 times 10 is 50. Hamishim Ama. These dimensions, 300 by 50 by 30, are actually. These two names multiplied. So the names are very significant. This is, this is when Noah received all the, all, the, all, the, all the protection. Incidentally, we have a law that is quite enigmatic. Our Torah tells us that we're not allowed to chop down trees. Specifically fruit bearing trees. I recently heard a story of course, the names we leave uh, anonymous to protect the innocent. That somebody recently went to a rabbi, a fellow that came on hard times in business. One of these uh, Kabbalistic uh, rabbis. And the rabbi looked at him and said, Many years ago you chopped down a fruit tree. That's the day that all these problems began. Chopped down a fruit tree. When did I chop? Then he remembered. He says, "Yes, when I bought my house, we had a fig tree in the backyard." He says, "I didn't know anything. Do I know a fig tree? Not fig tree. We chopped it down. We needed to build the uh, patio." What's the big deal? So you chopped down a fruit tree. So, so, well, Baruch Hashem, no chaser figs in the world. So you know, there's uh, so we didn't get figs from this tree. We get figs from another tree. And the explanation might be: How do you say a tree in Hebrew? Ilan Aleph Yod Lamid Nun 91 Barmanan chopping down a fruit tree is according to the Kabbalistic Shemot Who knows? It's not just cutting down a tree, it's racing a sefer Torah has Shalom. And therefore the significance is is very, very severe. Also, now you come to me and say, okay, Rabbi, what does this mean to me? I'm not a, I don't know how to make these combinations. I do sit in a sukkah, but the, how do I tap into this magic number 91? Amen. Amen. Aleph Mem Nun 91. Aleph Mem Nun is a name that has both Shemot of Akadosh Baruch Hu intertwined. And that's what the Gebarah means. Greater is the one that answers Amen more than the one that makes the blessing. Because the one that makes the blessing, he just says Yud Kevavke. But the one that says Amen, he's doing both. He's got Yud Kevavke and Adarut. He has the sweet and he's sweetening the bitter. Now already it's double sweet. Now already it's the highest Madrega. That's why it's the key to open up all the blessings. And that's what you came into this world to do. You're opening up Sha'arik and Eden with that. That name is able to do anything. And therefore when one answers Amen, his Kabbalah has to be threefold. Number one, Emet. What I just heard is true. That's always the Kabbalah of Emet, of Amen. It's true. Sometimes it has a second Kabbalah. It's true, Emet. And can you hear son? And let it come true. For example, in the Berachot of the Amidah, in the Hazara, the Hazan says, Baruch Atta Hashem Ta'at. God, you endow wisdom. You say, Amen. What's your kavana? It's true. God, you endow wisdom. And let it be. Can you hear son? Endow me with wisdom. So it's a double kavana. Sometimes it's only a single kabbana. For example, in the morning blessings, Baruch Atah Hashem Elokeinu Melech Ha'olam. Had no ten la sech bi bina la v'chin ben yomu ben nayla. God, you give wisdom to the rooster to say kakadoodle do at the crack of dawn. When you answer Amen, there the kabbana is emit. It's not Kenya Hirasol. Let it be. If you have in mind, let it be, 
What, God didn't do it already? Let it be? You're limiting the powers of God? So therefore, on blessings of praise, your kabbalah is amen, emit. If you're going to think, can you hear song? <laughs> you're questioning the powers of God. So now we're learning, you have to listen to the blessing in order to know exactly what your intent of amen is. Yeah? Third kabbalah, Havaya Adanu to merge. The 91 factor. Now, that's why the Hachamim spoke so seriously of those that don't answer Amen. Because it's disrespect, Has Shalom, to these holy names. Now let me tell you a story. You know we don't tell too many stories in this class. We like to keep it in Hindushim. But this is a story that must be told, and you'll see why. There was a great rabbi called Rabbi Mordechai Yafe. Rabbi Mordechai Yafe was a rabbi that lived in the 1500s, 1530 in Prague. This rabbi eventually wrote ten sefarim. The most famous of the sefarim is called the Levush. The Levush is a masterpiece in halakha. You cannot learn halakha without studying the opinion of the levush. And he wrote ten books, and all the books have the word levush in it. Levush means clothes. And there's a reason why he named all his books levush. That's another story. There's a story behind that. He got a letter from the city of Posen. They wanted him to become the chief rabbi. He got the letter, he said to himself, I'm not worthy yet. Even though he mastered 99% of the Torah, he said, there's one area of the Torah that I'm lacking in. And that is how to establish the Jewish calendar. Now that's one of the hardest studies. Making the Jewish calendar is not easy. You people think that the calendar was established by the PTA. No, the, the calendar actually is established by the great Hachamim and it's all a bunch of mathematical calculations and astronomical calculations to when to make Rosh Chodesh, to when the holidays fall out and the Rambam goes through at length discussing the years that you make a leap year when to make a leap year, when not he says, I don't have this wisdom before I can accept the position of Rabbinate I have to go to Venice What's in Venice? There was a great Sephardi rabbi, the Yitzhak Abu Hab, and he knows the intercalculations of the, of the calendar, and he'll teach it to me. So he set off to Venice. Okay, many members of our community also go to Venice. I'm sure they're going to study the calendar as well. In any event, when he gets to Venice, he studies from Rabbi Yitzhak Abu Ha, and he teaches of the calendar, and eventually he mastered it. He eventually wrote a book. We have this book, it's called Levush Adar Yekar, where he goes and discusses all the uh, Hindushim. But listen to the story that happened when the Levush was by Rabbi Yitzhak Abu Ha. One of the days he's there, Rabbi Yitzhak's son, child, whatever, young boy, walks in, makes a beracha, a, a, a piece of fruit. For whatever reason, the Levush who was engrossed in his learning did not answer Amin. Oh, Rabbi Yitzhak Abu Hab saw this. He told the Levush, leave immediately, you are in Harem. You are excommunicated. Now, excommunication is not a small thing. That means he's banned from his rabbi for 30 days. The students are not allowed to converse with him. They cannot walk within six feet of him. He cannot get an aliyah to the Sefer Torah, nor can they count them as part of the minyan. The Nebush didn't know what he did. Well, he didn't know what happened. What happened? What did he do? What did I do? He can't even ask anybody because he can't talk to anybody. So he became uh, very, very depressed and very sad, and he's waiting the 30-day sentence. After the 30 day sentence is over, he comes to his rabbi to be his haqab up crying. What's my sin? What did I do? Why do I deserve such a strict, harsh punishment? 
And Nabi Yitzhak Abba with a tear in his eyes said, My dear Rabbi Mordechai, I love you more than I love a son. On that day, when the Berakha was made in your presence, and you did not answer Amen, I saw in the heavens at that moment, there was a death sentence on you. And I had to take the death sentence off, so I put you in Hirim. And the punishment that I gave you in this world was able to exonerate you from that. <coughs> but let this be a lesson to you. What it means to miss a man. It's not just something, uh, you, you miss this one, you catch the next one. There are people in the Hazara. Tell me, you miss a man. But yeah, but there's 19, so I went 16 for 19. Uh, 16 for 19 is great. Yeah, from the foul line, 16 for 19 might be, uh, you know. But Namida, in the Hazara, you have to go 19 for 19. Here we're seeing he missed one, Amen. But he didn't finish the story yet. That means Hakam Wahab says, I will forgive you on one condition. You are now about to begin your career as a rabbi. Promise me that wherever you go to speak, throughout the world, promise me you will always tell over the following story. The Levu says, whatever the story you tell me, I'll tell it over. He says, here's the story. Tabi Yitzhak Abuab is rebuking his student now. True story. In Spain, there was a certain city-state where the king of that region was an anti-Semite. Okay, that shouldn't surprise anybody. And... From time to time he had his decrees against the Jews of Spain. And there was always a very influential Jew, a businessman, that the king enjoyed his company and the king uh, was his friend. So whenever the Jews were in trouble, they would send this Jew to petition the king. And sure enough, a Gezerah came, the king wants all the Jews to be uh, the expulsion of the Jews of, of that city state of Spain. So the Jews right away go to the Influential man, please, you heard about the Gezerah, you must petition the king on our behalf. He says, okay, let me pray Minha first. But Minha, the whole Jewish nation is in trouble, forget about Minha, go immediately. Okay, I'll pray in the palace. He goes. He starts to talk to the king, they're reminiscing, they're talking. He sees the king is in a very good mood, he says, it's easy. I'll be able to get the decree off. Good. He doesn't even mention it, he's just talking small talk. All of a sudden, a priest from a far off land made a long trip to visit this king of Spain. The priest walks in, bows to his feet, and starts kissing the, the ground where the king walks, and starts to give a benediction to the king in Latin. A long blessing. So the rabbi is standing on the, or the Jew is standing on the side, and he is the priest, going on and on and on. He says, you know what, this doesn't look like it's going to end so fast, this biracha. Let me go to the side and pray minha. And I missed the time of minha. So he went to the side to pray minha, and this guy's blessing him and blessing him. He's giving all the megillat this did. After the blessing is finished, the priest looks at everybody in the room, and now we're all going to answer, Amen. And all the people in the room say, Amen. And the priest looks, is there somebody in this room that does not answer, Amen. And they're looking, they're looking, they're looking. Now we all ask, oh, what's that guy doing in the corner? They said, ah, he's a Jewish guy, he's praying to Amida, he's praying. He didn't answer, Amen. He says, I have a tradition from the church that if this blessing, it's a long blessing, if everybody answers, Amen, it comes true. And now that one man in the room did not answer, Amen, the king is not going to enjoy these blessings. The king heard this, he was furious. He said, that rotten Jew... He deprived me from all my blessings. He didn't answer Amen. Off with his head. And all of a sudden, the gods came in and they beheaded the Jew. The man went from being the biggest ally of the king and now he became his biggest enemy. And he died a miserable death. And the word got out amongst the Jewish community. They couldn't believe it. The man was a sadiq. Why should God give him such a... Uh, a, a terrible ending. And listen what happened. One of his friends fasted for three days, begging that this man will come to him in a dream to explain to him what happened. And sure enough, three days later, he comes to him in a dream. And he says, Don't worry. I'm in Ganayadin. I'm good. I'm enjoying. 
And I'm sure you're bothered why this happened to me. But let me tell you what happened. When I was young, a fellow, a young boy came next to me and made a berachaham wasilah min aritz. And I didn't answer amen. And on that day there was a death sentence on me because of it. But God had compassion. But that day when I went to the palace and I didn't answer amen to the king's blessing, to a mortal king's blessing, and the king reacted like he did, the prosecuting angel said, if that's the way a mortal king reacts for not saying amen to one of his blessings, how much more so when somebody doesn't amen to the blessings of God? And they held me accountable. Let this be a lesson, Rabbi Yitzhak Abu Hav told his student to Levush. Let this be a lesson that even one Amen, to miss it, has dire consequence. The Levush listened to his rabbi. And he wrote in his book that every parent should tell this story to his children at least once a month. Vayhi Omen it hadasa. You have to teach them at a young age the value of it. That they shouldn't even miss one. Because of the value that it has. But if we're telling stories, allow me to tell you another episode. It's not easy to sell me a story, by the way. There's always people after the class try to tell me stories, thinking that I'm going to use it in one of the classes, and I'm very skeptical because, you know, a lot of these stories are, um, you know, I've said many times there's two types of stories. There's stories that happened, and stories that didn't happen yet. But, you know, you say, one day it will happen. The story I'm going to tell you now only because I heard it from a reliable man that told me the story was told over by Rav Chaim Sonnenfeld, which was the chief rabbi, the guardian, I'll call him, of Jerusalem, the rabbi of Jerusalem, Gaon Ve'adir, and he wasn't a storyteller, he was no, no beans. <clears throat> he said the story like this. And how does he know the story of Chaim Sonnenfeld? Because he was involved in the story. This is a rabbi of the 1800s. You're not going to believe the story. I'm going to give you now a chills warning. Warning you will get the chills from this story. So whoever is uh, allergic to the chills, you can walk out for a couple of minutes. Guaranteed. There was a lady that was married to a wealthy man, Jews. And she was a very, very fine lady. And Baruch Hashem, she had excess money. And she said, you know what? I want to do something with my money. Besides shopping and all that. I want to, I want to do something for clients with my money. But I want to do something different. Something that nobody ever did. So she's thinking, what can I do? Which is a very good thing. You should always think of good ideas, novel ideas, how to give charity. She said, what happens to all these people that die... And they don't have children to say Kaddish for them. Or they don't have relatives to say Kaddish. The Kaddish, the Zohar says, elevates the soul. What happens to these people? What, their souls are not elevated? She says, I'm going to go to the yeshiva, and I'm going to hire the young students, and I'm going to pay them a salary, and I'm going to give them names, I'm going to investigate, and any time somebody passes away that doesn't have a Kaddish, they're going to say the Kaddish for that person. What a great uh, concept, what a zechut, what a chesed. And she did it, and she had these people on payroll, and she would get the names, and it became a thing. Anybody that needs to say the Kaddish, she go to her, and she sets it up. What a zechut. As life uh, is cyclical, and, you know, the cycle of life, her husband died. When her husband died, the luck died with him. And now she went from being a very aristocratic lady and she lost all her money and she became practically destitute. It's a sad story. So destitute, one day she was just walking the streets all despondent and depressed. So a man sees her, a man says, you look very upset, I want to help you. What, you want to help me? I don't know who you are. You can't help me. I have debts. I have pressure. She says, I'm a man of means. I can help you. Let me give you a check for what you need, and you'll pay me back. 
She was hesitant, but she says, fine. He says, yeah, but you need to bring two witnesses to see me sign this check. Because I don't know if the bank is going to take the check without witnesses. She says, what do you mean? What do you mean? <laughs> what do you mean? Witnesses, it's not kid to bow there. You go to the check, you give them a check. No, 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 please. Bring me two honest people that can vouch that I signed this check. She says, okay, they go to the yeshiva. She brings a rabbi and she brings a chayim son in felt. He was the witness. They look at the man, he signs the check. Okay, very good. substantial money. The next day she goes to the bank. She goes to the cash, to the teller. The teller looks at the check. Oh, this is a high number. I cannot cash you. You have to go to the supervisor. It's even in the 1800s, they had the bureaucracy of banks. You stand in line for 20 minutes and they put you to the next... Uh, go to the supervisor, to the supervisor, to the supervisor. So he Finally she gets to the president of the bank. She walks in, she gives him the check, he looks at the check, he passes out, he faints. They wake him up, they give him the smelling sauce, whatever they do. He looks at her, he says, you got a check from this person? He says, yes. You know what this person looks like? If I show you a picture, could you identify this person? She says, of course, I saw him yesterday. He turns around to a picture on his wall. He says, this person is my father. He's the one, he looks, he says, 100%. How is it possible? My father died last year. How could he have given you a check? This is his signature and this is his bank account. How could he have given you this? She says, wait. He said that this might happen. There's witnesses. They go to the yeshiva, they bring the rabbi. Yes, that's the man, I saw him sign it. You saw him sign it? The fellow looks at them and says... My father came to me in a dream last night. And he told me that somebody's going to come to the bank today with a check with his signature. And he told me, cash it. And he said, you know why? He says, because when he died, I wasn't religious. I didn't say Kaddish. And that lady, she paid rabbis in order to elevate my soul. And because of that, I came back from the dead in order to pay her back. Could you imagine a story? A man came back from the dead in order to give the... This is not fairy tales. What's the significance of Kaddish? Why is Kaddish so important? So people think, because you're saying it, Kaddavik. Nah. You know what the value of Kaddish is? The Amen. Because you're enabling people to answer. You're giving people now a zikhut to say amen. So you're doing something to the credit of the niftar. And therefore when those people hear Kaddish and they answer amen, it elevates the soul. You're doing the greatest chesed to the niftar. But imagine how somebody's talking during the Kaddish he misses an amen. What a... What a, what, a, what a disgrace to the neshama. How sensitive we have to be in the synagogue or wherever we might be when we hear these aminim to be said or to be answered. Rabotai. Based on what we're saying here tonight, I'm going to tell you one last episode. There was once a doctor, a secular doctor, that came to Rabbi Moshe Feinstein with a question. Basically the question was, the fellow was critically ill. If they give him an operation, he might get six more months to live, maximum. It's going to be a very painful operation and very costly. The question is given to Rav Moshe. Do we take the operation or not? The secular doctor writes that he was impressed when Rav Moshe heard the case. He started to cry, Rav Moshe Feinstein. He had such a soft heart. He says, Rav Moshe didn't hear any less cases of tragedy than he did as a doctor. The difference was the doctor was already desensitized and Rav Moshe was still sensitive to the plight of every Jew. 
Rabbi Moshe said, I have to think about it. Come tomorrow. He came tomorrow and he said, do the operation. Giving him another six months will give him the opportunity to answer Amen. And once he has the zikhut to answer Amen, he'll have more years to live. The six months will give him more chance to answer Amen, and that will extend his life further. And Rabbi Moshe explained himself. He said, because every time you answer Amen, you create for yourself a guardian angel. And the angel comes and protects you. And he said, <coughs> the numerical value of the word Malach, 91. The same numerical value as Emma. A childless man came to the Baba Sali and asked him for a blessing to have children. He said, You'll have children. Your wife will conceive this year. And she conceived. But she had a miscarriage. The fellow came back to Baba Sali and said, I don't think this is the blessing the rabbi meant to give me. Baba Sali didn't say anything. He was about to put on his talit in the morning, the shahrit. He told ten men, come inside. He says, I want you to answer amen to my berakhah, the talit, with all your kavana. Baruch, all the kavanot of the rash, of the rash he has. Baba Sali said it, the ta'atip is his seat. Ten men answered amen. He put on his talit, he tells the fellow, you have nothing to worry about. Your wife will have a baby boy next year. She gave birth on that day. A year that day that they answered Amen. Now you know the master key we're talking about? When answered the right way, when one pays attention during the Hazara, during the Kaddishim, look what it can bring down to the world. It's so neglected. It's such an easy item. Which means we're not coming to this class telling you to get blessing you have to fast. You have to sleep in the mikveh. You have to do all sorts of roll in the snow and all these type of uh, sigufim. We're telling you something that's s- s- relatively simple. Shomer emunim. So let me tell you of the latest fair, and I'll conclude with this. The latest fair that has hit the Jewish, uh, the Jewish circle. It seems there's been a lot of awareness now to this concept of answering Amen. So, you know, Jews, whenever they have an excuse to make a party, you know, they're always, uh, you know, the first to take advantage. So the latest fad amongst the Yehudim now is they're making berachot parties. It's a berachot party. You have uh, ten friends. They get together for the sole purpose. Well, one guy invites them to the house, maybe the couples, whatever it is. And they put on the table all sorts of uh, berachot. Gefen, Adama, Eitz, Mezonot, Shehiyanu. And now they all sit down at the table. The first one picks up the uh, Gefen. Bore Priya Gefen. Everybody, Amen! Oh, Chanem, we just got another gate. Okay, now you say the Gefen. Bore Priya Gefen. Amen! And they go around the table. Each one makes Berachot. Each one answers, but they go in with Kavana. That's the purpose of the party. And they walk out laden with with the blessings of God. So, this is something we should think about. You want to throw a berachot party? Berachot atzlacha. What a great thing. And I'll tell you one last story. So I don't like to tell stories. I'm going off the normal derech. But one personal story. To show you the value of what we're talking about. I once was in Montreal... And I was about to live, the deliver a shi'ur. And one of the ladies there, God bless her, came to me and said, Rabbi, I want you to know that your, uh, your tapes, your CDs, the, the shi'urim, they changed my life to the better. So I was a little curious. I said, forgive me for asking, but which, which derash was it? You know, which... You know, if it, if it was an effective dirasha, God gave us siyata uh, dishmaya that night to inspire somebody. We'll make copies of it. We'll, it's... So she blushed a little. She said, "I'm embarrassed to say, it uh, it wasn't something you actually preached on the tape. The, the, the color of the tape brought you back to religion. What, 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 that's all we do on the tape. We just preach." She says, "Actually, I haven't made a blessing." In 
years. And I, I eat without making benachot. And I sat down to listen to your tape and I had a cup of water in front of me. And I'm about to drink it, again, without making a blessing. And all of a sudden, on the tape, I hear you say, Baruch atah Hashem elokeinu melech haolam shakol niyamit baro. And everybody answers, Amen. And oh my God, the rabbi saw me. The rabbi knows. I was about to drink the water, and he's rebuking me. I said, what are you talking about? I said, I do that every class. I have the coffee in front of me. I make a beraka. So sometimes the beraka comes on the tape. says, no, this was uh, divine. And nothing was divine. I always drink coffee on there. But if, if Hashem may... And from this, she says, I shut the tape. He says, I don't have to do anything else. I have to make the jubah. I start. And from there, she went, she probably got better tapes and maybe became a the jubah from somebody else. But the point is, the beraka. And therefore, do not underestimate what we're saying here today. And Be'azat Hashem, if we can train ourselves in this, if we can train our children, train ourselves, limit our talking in the synagogue, run to hear the Kaddish. I can't, I'm excited now, we're going to say Kaddish a Israel. What a zikhud the Amir is. I didn't tell you the kavanot of the Amir of the Kaddish according to the Be'erish. I, the whole other subject, it's two other names of a Kaddish Baruch which is, can even be higher. <laughs> yeah, and... Havaya, which is a whole other story. But Be'azat Hashem, if we can tap into this great resource, to be a nation that is Shomer Emunim, and Bore Awalam will open us the gates, V'yavo Goy Sadiq, the righteous nation will enjoy all the Berachot in this world, and all the Berachot, in the world to come. Baruch Adonai Le'olam. Amen. Amen. Rabbi Hananam Le'kashi Amen. Asalaam Baruch Hashem 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 Le'kashi Amen.